Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed for our third CES 2021 news video taking a look at the latest announcements from NVIDIA. They were the only one of the three main companies that decided not to run pre-briefings for their CES news, which is fine, but that's why we are coming to you later in the day with a recap and analysis of their announcements. Their event was at 4 a.m. or something for us local time. Not a great time to be honest, but stuff rarely is when you live in Australia. If you have missed it in the last couple of days, we have detailed both AMD and Intel's CES announcements in separate videos, so it could be well worth looking back at those videos for all the news on Ryzen Mobile 5000, Tiger Lake H35, and teasers for Intel's Core i9-11900K. And before we get into today's news, here is a word from our video sponsors, MSI. IPS is renowned for producing some of the best colors available for gaming monitors, but it's always come at a trade-off. MSI has taken their engineering to a whole new level with the introduction of a revolutionary rapid IPS panel that's backed with Quantum Dot technology. For the first time ever, the new MSI Optics MAG274QRF-QD gives you game-changing speed with unprecedented color accuracy that our class is the best of the best that we've tested here on the channel. Revel in rich, deep, incredible color and push your gaming to its limits with one millisecond greater gray response times and ultra fast 165 hertz refresh rates if a gaming monitor could be described as coming close to perfect this would be it so learn more about msi's new optics mag 274 qrf-qd monitor via the links below i'm going to kick this video off with a discussion of nvidia's desktop gpu announcements and then move into a look at the mobile parts a bit later nvidia has announced today a new entrant into their rtx 30 series lineup and i think this is something that basically everyone was expecting, the GeForce RTX 3060. This is the natural evolution of NVIDIA's 30 series as NVIDIA continues to fill out the product stack with lower tiered products. The last entrant was the 3060 Ti in December, and now in January we're getting the announcement of the 3060, which makes sense. Here are the basic specifications for the RTX 3060. It's using new Ampere Silicon GA106, which brings with it 3584 CUDA cores or 28 SMs, slightly lower than the RTX 2060's 30 SMs, but of course with Ampere's double FP32 design it should end up faster overall. And as an Ampere product we're getting other stuff here too like Nvidia's second generation RT core design and third generation tensor cores, plus the same media encoding and decoding capabilities as other Ampere products. Clock speeds are listed at 1380 MHz base and 1780 MHz boost, giving us peak single precision raw performance of 12.8 teraflops. Although as a reminder, if you are comparing products based on teraflop numbers, you can only compare within a generation on the same architecture. There's also 12 GB of GDDR6 memory on a 192-bit bus. However, Nvidia are yet to specify clock speeds for the memory. We're probably looking at 14 gigabits per second, given that's the spec used for the 3060 Ti and 37. There are definitely some interesting things to see here in this spec sheet. The inclusion of 12 gigabytes of GDDR6 is particularly interesting given that higher end products such as the RTX 3060 Ti, RTX 3070 and even the RTX 3080 have smaller memory buffers. There have been some rumors of a 6 gigabyte variant, but what we have right now is a 12 gigabyte model, possibly in response to what AMD has been doing with their products lately in offering much higher 16 gigabyte VRAM buffers in their high end. Having a mid range card with more VRAM will sting for early adopters of higher end Ampere products, but I think it's the right move, especially as more games are on a knife's edge with 8 gigabytes of VRAM in terms of high quality settings, especially with ray tracing enabled. 12 gigabytes will provide better future proofing and should make the RTX 3060 easier to recommend. As for pricing and availability, the card is listed at $329 US and will be available in late February. Given recent supply issues and a wildly inflated pricing across the board for lots of different GPU models, I'm not particularly inclined to believe any of what Nvidia is saying in terms of pricing or availability. I think the benefit of the doubt has well and truly eroded at this point and it's up to Nvidia to execute with widespread availability to regain the trust of consumers. I guess the good news is that the RTX 3060's launch is far enough away in the future, it is a month and a half away, that there is some possibility that there will be stock around that time. but. Wouldn't be holding my breath, and like basically every other hardware launch in the past six months, I would be expecting there to be virtually no availability. This will make it hard to assess whether the card is actually good, given mid-range products rely heavily on their attractive price point, and if the 3060 is $500 instead of $330, that will change the discussion significantly. 
Nvidia have made a limited selection of performance claims, mostly focused around 1080p gaming and comparisons between the RTX 3060, RTX 2060 and the GTX 1060. Versus the 2060, the 3060 is shown anywhere from 15 to 50% faster, although Nvidia appear to be showing around the 25% mark as typical. Naturally, the GTX 1060 is much slower, especially as it has no accelerated ray tracing capabilities, and most of Nvidia's benchmarks are with ray tracing enabled. Based on our previous benchmarking, this should see the RTX 3060 slot in somewhere around the mark of NVIDIA's RTX 2070 Super. So NVIDIA are doing something quite similar to other Ampere designs in offering the previous generation's tier above performance. For example, the RTX 3060 Ti was around the mark of the RTX 2080 Super, and now the RTX 3060 appears to be similar to the RTX 2070 Super. This is a healthy performance boost and the expected MSRP being slightly lower than the RTX 2060's $350 launch price does help the situation, provided they will actually be available at that price. However, the 3060 is unlikely to provide the same enormous performance improvements at the same price as higher tier Ampere cards. Top end products like the RTX 3080 providing 50% plus gains over their predecessors was also a response to poor pricing for high end Turing products. Whereas with mid-tier cards like the RTX 2060 and now the 3060, pricing was always more reasonable, so there's less of a correction to make. This may disappoint those that wanted a massive leap forward, but these sorts of gains are still quite a lot better than what we got at this price point in the Turing generation. I guess the final thing to mention here is the power rating. NVIDIA are putting a 170 watt sticker on the RTX 3060, which is 30 watts below the 3060 Ti and 10 watts above the RTX 2060. Given the RTX 2070 Super was a 215 watt card and looks to be most similar in performance, the RTX 3060 should present a decent improvement to efficiency, although again, we'll have to wait for the final numbers to come in. Overall on first glance, I think the RTX 3060 looks decent, and is likely to be a more attractive mid-range card than the RTX 2060 was in the market at the time. However, that's all contingent on there actually being supply at the listed $330 MSRP, and given what we've seen over the last months, I highly doubt this will be the case, so it could end up being another rather uneventful launch, but we'll just have to wait for the end of February to find out all about that. Next up, we have NVIDIA's RTX 30 Series 4 Mobile, which comprises of three main GPUs and multiple sub-variants. Those three GPUs are the RTX 3080 laptop, the RTX 3070 laptop, and the RTX 3060 laptop, which are the official names for these parts. All will be available beginning on January 26th, which is also when we expect AMD to release their Ryzen 5000 H series parts into the wild, so a selection of new laptops will feature an update to both parts at the same time. Before getting stuck into the specifications analysis, I do want to point out that all three Ampere laptop GPUs do have different names than their desktop counterparts. The official names all include laptop at the end, which is different to the 20 series, where the RTX 2070 for desktops and laptops, as an example, were both just called RTX 2070, something that did confuse customers as both variants did not deliver the same performance. Adding laptop to the official name is a step in the right direction and helps separate the desktop parts from the laptop parts. I still don't think it's quite enough as buyers could easily miss the laptop part or just assume it's the same as the desktop GPU. I really wish Nvidia would return to using RTX 3080M type naming, but it's better than nothing and at least from what I've seen in several spec sheets for new RTX 30 series laptops, laptop manufacturers are including the correct GPU name. Why is naming so important this generation? Well, simply put, the RTX 30 laptop series is not even close to the same as the RTX 30 series for desktops. Each of the three GPUs use a fundamentally different core configuration and in several cases a different memory configuration as well. So when you are buying an RTX 3080 laptop GPU, you aren't getting the same GPU as the RTX 3080 in the desktop form factor. The RTX 3080 laptop does not use the GA102 die from the desktop GPU, but instead opts for a fully unlocked GA104 silicon. This means there is a substantial difference in core configuration between the parts. 8,704 FP32 cores on the desktop 3080, but just 6,144 on the laptop GPU. The memory setup is also different, with either 8 or 16 gigabytes of GDDR6 memory on a 256-bit bus, compared to 10 gigabits of GDDR6X on the desktop card. 
Nvidia provide a clock speed range for these GPUs starting at 1245 MHz and going up to 1710 MHz boost depending on the power configuration. And boy are there a lot of power configurations. OEMs have the choice between three Max-Q setups ranging from 80 to 90 watts or between eight Max-P configurations that go from 115 watts to 150 watts in 5 watt increments. Max-Q GPUs get 12 gigabits per second memory while Max-P has 14 gigabits per second further splitting the pack. So in total, while Nvidia only lists a single RTX 3080 laptop GPU, there are 11 configurations in the wild, and most of the time you really won't know what you are getting unless the laptop you are after provides power or clock speed information to you in the spec sheet. So have fun with that. Next up is the RTX 3070 laptop, which uses a cut down GA104 die with 5120 CUDA cores down from 5888 with the RTX 3070 desktop. The memory configuration is closer here with 8GB of GDDR6 on a 256-bit bus clocked at the usual 12 or 14 gigabits per second depending on whether you get Max-Q or Max-P. Luckily for RTX 3070 laptop GPU buyers, Nvidia have the fewest configurations, 3 Max-Q from 80 to 90 watt and 3 Max-P at 115, 120 and 125 watts. Clock speeds range from 1920 MHz to 1620 MHz boost depending on that power rating. Then we get to the RTX 3060 laptop, which surprisingly includes more CUDA cores than the RTX 3060 desktop card at 3840 versus 3584, pointing to 30 SMs enabled on the GA106 die. However, we are just getting 6GB of GDDR6 memory here, not 12GB, and once again we can expect a lot of different power configurations. While I don't have as much information here compared to the higher end SKUs, I believe there are 3 Max-Q variants between 60 and 70 watts, plus 8 Max-P variants between 80 and 115 watts. The total clock speed range is 1283 to 1703 MHz boost. In total, my understanding is that OEMs can choose between 28 different RTX 30 series laptop GPU variants to meet what their coolers can do and what price point they're targeting, which is significantly more than what was available with the Turing generation. While this does provide great flexibility for OEMs to fine tune their offerings based on what their designs are capable of, it will make buying an RTX 30 series laptop harder than ever, as in most cases you won't know what the power configuration will be, and ultimately that is what determines performance. Pricing for these laptops should be similar to previous generations. RTX 3060 laptop GPUs should start in $1,000 systems, RTX 3070 laptop GPUs in $1,300 models, and RTX 3080 laptops at $2,000. Again, availability is starting on January 26th, although with current supply issues, who knows when they'll actually be available. As for NVIDIA's performance claims, we don't have a whole lot of data to go on at this point. NVIDIA is showing the RTX 3080 laptop outperforming the RTX 2080 laptop in a few games by between 40 and 60%. Meanwhile, the RTX 3070 laptop is described as up to 1.5 times faster than the RTX 2070, and the RTX 3060 is described as 1.3 times faster than the the PlayStation 5, which is, yeah, just a stupid comparison to make in my opinion, really tells us nothing. If Nvidia's claims here are accurate, that would give Nvidia's laptop GPUs lower gains over their predecessor than their desktop counterparts. For example, with the RTX 3070, we saw 60% better performance than the RTX 2070 at 1440p on average, which is lower than the up to 50% Nvidia is claiming for the laptop parts. But this is to be expected, the RTX 3070 on desktop has a 76% higher TDP than in laptops, whereas the TDP was only 52% higher for the RTX 2070 generation. Laptops simply do not have the capability to just increase power levels, which is what Nvidia did with the Ampere generation on desktop, so performance improvements will be lower. Based on this and previous margins between desktop and laptop GPUs from NVIDIA, I would expect these laptop chips to sit in the tiers below their desktop variants. So the RTX 3080 laptop is probably going to be around RTX 3070 or RTX 2080 Ti performance in practice. RTX 3070 laptops probably between an RTX 3060 and 3060 Ti, and the RTX 3060 models somewhere uh, below the desktop variant. Despite all of this, we are still in for what appears to be a substantial gain over previous laptop GPUs thanks to the new Ampere architecture and Samsung 8 nanometer node. Nvidia's RTX 20 Super Refresh for laptops didn't really bring a lot to the table, but this should be a true next generation upgrade for laptop buyers with a lot more performance available at a given price point. Nvidia also announced third generation Max-Q technology, which includes several new features. 
One is Dynamic Boost 2.0, NVIDIA's dynamic power allocation technology that monitors game performance on a frame-by-frame -frame basis and increases GPU power at the expense of CPU power when it makes sense to do so for the best FPS. Version 2.0 of this tech also now includes GPU VRAM power in the calculation and is mandatory for all Mac's Q laptops, which should increase adoption as it wasn't used very often with previous generation laptops. Whisper Mode 2.0 is also new, which aims to reduce the noise and heat output of a laptop at the expense of performance when enabled. This updated version is apparently now being integrated into laptops at a system level, rather than just as a feature in GeForce Experience, which should allow for better optimization and greater control over system fans. Then we also get Resizable Bar, which is just a PCIe specification that NVIDIA is now enabling on laptops, and soon desktops as well, to increase performance in some situations. On the desktop side, we can expect support starting with the RTX 3060, although for other GPUs, apparently a vBIOS update is required, and that will be coming in March. From today, you should be seeing announcements from all the major laptop vendors with new RTX 30 series gaming laptops. Some of these products will be using Ryzen 5000 APUs from AMD, with several companies now willing to ship Ryzen paired with high-end NVIDIA GPUs like the RTX 3080, so that's great to see. Others will be a simple refresh on NVIDIA's 10th Gen H series, just with new GPUs, and a small selection will update to 11th Gen Tiger Lake H35 processors, although this should be the minority. Anyway, that's it for NVIDIA's main announcements at CES 2021. This wraps up our coverage of the main three companies, which for once at CES did actually announce quite a few things. Usually one company or maybe even two companies only comes in with very minor announcements, but we did get new products from all the three main companies, which is, yeah, quite exciting for us. And yeah, we'll be getting to reviewing as many of these products as we can in the coming months. We will be back for a look at the rest of the CES news, perhaps later in the week, if there's anything interesting to talk about. So subscribe to get that in your inbox. You can, of course, support us through Patreon Floatplane as well if you're interested. And that's it. Catch you in the next one.